Hello everyone, I am Torrance Kroner and I am a marketing major at San Diego State University. Today we had Dr. H on campus and he was helping us learn how to find our purpose in life. I really enjoyed his speech because he came in with great energy and he made his audience feel like he really cared about who we were as individuals. The main message that I got from Dr. H was that we are in control of our own destinies. We cannot just sit around and wait for an opportunity to strike us. We must make it ourselves. We need to network ourselves and show people what we bring to the table. It is never too early to invest in your passions. Hey, what's going on, family, and welcome to the Rise to It podcast, your home for personal and professional development. My name is Jonathan Hernandez, a.k.a. the letter H, and with us today, we got our boys, Mr. Andre Covington. We got Mr. Frankie Leal, but without further ado, the ABC Queen B, Amanda Aguilar. Thanks for joining us. What's going on? What's going on? Amanda, thank you so much for joining. It's about time, man. It's about time you join our podcast. What's up? I've been waiting. I'm like, when are they going to have me? And now, here it is. The day is finally here. The day is here, and we've worked with, yeah, we've worked with Amanda for several events now through Rise to It, going around Central Valley, inspiring, motivating students. So before we get into all that, what's been up in your world? What's going on? Oh, what has been going on? You know, I think I've been really focusing on my podcast, which I know we'll talk about later, um, but just really kind of putting a lot of energy into that. Obviously, you know, I am a full-time news reporter, but I think it's also really important to have things that light you up on the side. And so I realized that a podcast uh, definitely lights me up, helping people and empowering, inspiring people. So I make sure to have time for, you know, whatever lights me up in life. So I've been doing that aside from work and then, you know, just enjoying the fact that I'm so close to my parents now. You know, news has taken me all over the place from D.C. to Kansas to Georgia finally in California. Yes. And so I'm only three hours away from my parents in the Bay. So when I get the chance, I always like to go visit them and, you know, spend time with my friends. Cause that's for maybe six years. I didn't get to get to really do that. Cause I was across the country. So now that I'm close to them, you know, I make the most of it. That's really cool. I know you talked about your family a lot and through IG, I've, I feel like I know your parents because a lot of the similarities. They're crazy. That we have. They're yeah. wild. Talk about that. You're like your upbringing from the Bay area, full circle back to Cali. Talk about that just a little bit. You know, I feel like when I was in the Bay area, I mean, I was just a little hyphy girl. Um, I think little Amanda was very, feisty, very, uh, energetic. Yeah. Yeah. That didn't change. Um, I always like to tell this story to people that I was proud. I am a proud leash child. My parents had me on a leash because I just always would wander and say hi to people. I was just a very friendly uh, child. Um, you, sometimes you see those videos of like kids walking down the aisle and like plane, you know, planes and they're like, hi, hi, hi. That was me. Um, always saying hi to people. And then you get to, you know, high school, Amanda. And that was a very different Amanda, that Amanda wild out. That was the rebel. I'm the only child. And I always tell people, I feel so bad because my parents had one child and I ended up being the rebel, being the troublemaker. (laughs) Like I feel so bad for them, but you know what? I, I always, and I've shared this, you know, before when we go into, um, empowerment conferences with the students, you know, I wasn't a great student, you know, I definitely struggled with grades. I was getting in trouble, detention, like that was my home. Um, but then it really took a teacher believing in me for me to see my potential. Um, and that's when the fire kind of ignited in Amanda to chase after her dreams of being a news reporter and going into journalism. So I went to Dominican University in the Bay Area, just over uh, the Golden Gate Bridge, and I just did everything 
possible to make my dreams come true of being in the journalism industry. And that took me to grad school in DC, where I got my first internship at NBC Washington, um, got my first job before I even ended my internship. And so my first job was in Kansas. And, you know, I brought that Bay flavor to Kansas, to the Midwest. I always love when people would be like, you're not from here, huh? I'm like, no, I'm from the Bay Area, okay? Let them know. Yeah. Um, and so just continued chasing after my dreams from Kansas to Georgia and now back here to California, back home. Um, and so it's really special to be back. Really, really cool. So Bay Area, did you have any experience with the Fresno, Central California area region before you came on over here? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. All I knew about Fresno was like, it was the stop if people needed to stop before going to Disneyland or something, you know? Yeah, stop city. Um, So I had never visited Fresno, but it's actually interesting because when I was interviewing for the position at ABC 30, um, my mom grew up in Stockton and then her parents moved to Lodi area. And so when I was telling her, yeah, you know, I'm interviewing for this position in Fresno and she was like, oh my gosh, she was like, you know, your grandpa used to work off the fields off the 99, you know? And she was like, I remember when I was little, he'd bring me and your uncle and we'd help farm. Um, that's how he would be like, okay, that's how we're getting to Disneyland. You know, you guys have to help work. And so it was just kind of weird because that's kind of what I knew Fresno as is just like a lot of land. And so to think, you know, my grandpa just off the 99, you know, was helping farm some of those, some of the land and even my mom, I was like, oh, that's kind of full circle in a way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Who do you take after? So yeah, we're going to get into the energy that you bring, (laughs) but mother or father, and I'm blessed. I see your IG and I'm like, I feel like I know them, but (sighs) you kind of have a combination of both. I feel like I have a combination of both. I think I get my very feisty attitude from my mom. And then I think I get my goofiness from my dad because he's just very goofy. Sometimes he says jokes and I'm like, bruh, it's not even funny. But like (laughs) he thinks he's so funny and like he loves cracking jokes, very dad jokes. Um, And he just, you know, sometimes doesn't take himself very seriously. And I think I get that from him. Whereas my mom, she's, you know, very independent. Um, she, She has some attitude, you know, and I always say, you're getting mad at me for the attitude like where do you think I got it from um, so I think it's a combination of both for sure and he let you off the hook a little bit there about the combination <laughs> like what is the percentage is it 60% oh, more mom you or know what dad? I want to say I want to say maybe 60% my mom 40% my dad okay yeah right. I would definitely say my mom for sure now that I'm older I can see similarities but before when I was younger and she'd be like oh that reminds me of me or you're just like me I'm like oh my god don't say that like I'm not like you and then I'm older now I'm like wait a minute I actually mm-hmm. see it yep I see it <laughs> you can also see it's not that bad Right. Yeah. yeah. No, I got a lot of, it does. Yeah. I feel like just the work ethic from both my parents, you know, I feel like has helped me get very far in where I am today. And so I appreciate that about them. Um, but yeah, I just, it's, it's funny looking back now at like, oh yeah, I really am my parents, (laughs) like Uh just combined. (laughs) Talk about those cultural influences, because I know you and I have had conversations before events, and you're like, oh, yeah, my mom's like this. I was like, so is my mom. So I know we have some ties, obviously, a a very Latinx dominated population here in Sencal, but we also have a very high Filipino culture representation. Talk about that. I think that's beautiful. I think being Filipino, full Filipino, and people always are like, why you're full Filipino? Because I do look mixed. Um, but there is that cultural aspect. I think the the work ethic, and you can say that, you know, for the Latin Latinx community, there's this work ethic. You constantly work hard um, and you chase after your dreams. I don't think there was ever a time that I would tell my parents like, something that I wanted or a goal. And they were just like, then you have to work hard. You know, you have to chase your dreams. Um, Obviously in Asian, you know, the Asian culture, education is huge. Um, They drill that into you, you know? And so it's taking your education seriously. I'm not even going to lie though. In high school, I didn't take my education (laughs) seriously, you know? Um, But that was huge. You know, you have to get good grades, you know, if you want to succeed and you want to go to college. Um, But there's also just for Filipinos and I'm sure many other cultures, just the family aspect. Mm -hmm. Family is everything. And I... I really honestly didn't get that until maybe 
the pandemic. Um, you know, when I was going around chasing my dreams and, and I remember my dad's side of the family, they would always be like, no, don't leave California. Like, don't leave your family. You know, you have to be with them. And, you know, I'm blessed that my parents were like, don't listen to them. Just go, you know, just go. You, you're still young. You're not married. You have no kids. Like, go and travel. Um, but it came to the pandemic where I was like, oh my gosh, I miss my family. And then I got back to California. And now I'm at that age where it's like, I want to be with my family. I want to take care of them. Even though my mom is like, we're not old yet. You're not going to be our caregiver. But I'm like, no, I, I want to be there. You know, if you have a, a doctor's appointment, like I want to be able to take you if you can't go. And whereas when, you know, a little younger Amanda, I was just like, whatever, my family, they're there, you know, I'll see them when I see them. But now I really understand, you know, that that family really is everything and that, um, you know, they're there when no one else is. And I think the pandemic was definitely the the kind of moment where I realized that. And that's honestly why I came back to California was because I was like, I need to be near my family. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's time. That's very cool. Now, let me ask you this, because I know Dre he had a sold out comedy show. I was in the house. Me and Maddie showed up uh, right before the headliner went and Dre was like emceeing. And it's beautiful to see your wife. B was there. Bernique was there. Yes. But I know she doesn't catch you on every show. She's probably like, eh, whatever, right? Because you do so many shows. Yeah. And Maddie is the same way with me. My wife is like, yeah, you're going to do a speaking engagement. Okay. Like, all right. You know, then they'll be your biggest critic sometimes. Oh, yeah. Does your family watch your shows a lot? Or oh, do they gosh. watch a few and then they're like, okay, it's, it's whatever. So I think when I first started, ABC 30. Well, even when I was in Kansas and Georgia, cause there was streaming. So they would watch, you know? Um, and then when I got here, they, they watched as well, but now, I mean, they're retired. And so sometimes I'll call them after a show. It's like seven 30 and they're, I can tell they're just waking up. I'm like, why are you not awake? Like, did you watch me? And they're like, no, we didn't watch you. I'm like, why didn't you watch me? And they're like, because we're retired and we don't have to wake up. And I'm like, you know what? Pop off that. I get that. Okay. But they're, yeah, they're, <laughs> times, especially if I, you know, tell them, Ooh, I have this exciting live shot coming up. You know, can you, you know, watch me and they'll watch me or if I'm anchoring at the desk, they'll watch, but they'll probably only watch for like 30 minutes and then they'll go back to sleep. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. And so, but they, like you said, they are my biggest critics too. Like sometimes I remember getting texts from my mom, like, why are you wearing that? You know, or like mm. your hair, like, why did you do your hair like that? Um, but otherwise they're, they're very supportive <laughs> for the most part. <laughs> I, I will say this. Um, my wife is probably at about 95% of my shows. Oh, really? That's 90, awesome. High, the high, That's high, high high end. Yeah. Really high. yeah. And you, the one that you went to, mm -hmm. she worked the door. Yeah. She collected she the, the money. That's the one I seen. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I still haven't received that money if she's watching. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, but she, and I had a show uh, this past Friday where I was a headliner mm -hmm, and yeah. she was in the audience. And yeah. then here's the deal. She used to critique me a lot. Now she just encourages me. That's, That's awesome. Dope. She just That's says, good. wow, you, yo, you were really hot tonight. You were really yeah. doing it. I like your outfit. Now she kind of holds back on the critiquing as much since she's more on a congratulative type of situation. Like, yeah, he's encouraging me to say, like, you know, you know, you really should expand on that joke. That was funny. Right. You know, mm. you can add to that. So it's a progress. I think, you know, oh, yeah. sometimes, you know, the people who are as closest to you, it, they realize that maybe I'm being a little too hard. Yeah. yeah, you know, maybe I need to just kind of like Tone encourage and not critique because you're gonna already get that from everybody else. Right. You're getting right. that in comedy in instantly from the crowd. Sure. Yeah. I don't know how you do it, honestly. Yeah, I difficult. think it's so difficult to just put yourself out there yeah. and then just hopefully these jokes land. You know, <laughs> and it's like mm -hmm. I I it's, I commend yeah. you for that because that's difficult. Yeah. It's yeah. like doing somersaults your eyes close you yeah. know yeah. and you don't know if there's going to be a floor there yeah. you don't know it's just like you're just flipping like okay i hope there's a floor there <laughs> and that's how the jokes are i say it all the time i feel like comedians have the hardest job you know to go up there like and celeste said it the other day three minutes is like an eternity for some mm. comics you know mm -hmm. like because if they're not if the people are not laughing yeah man that one minute turns into like <laughs> feels Preach. like 10 minutes right i'd run off the um, stage if no one was <laughs> yeah, laughing right. be like never mind i'll see my way out <laughs> you're right because you first start off you're like you got five minutes like Whoo. yeah man then like you know i i was i had to do 45 minutes this past friday wow. and, and at 45 he was like telling me i said well stick me at 45 I still had so much more to talk about. I ended up doing like another 10 minutes, yeah. but I was like, it's okay if I go a little long. The crowd was like, yeah. So <laughs> I said, all right, tell that to him, the guy who was like, you know, paying the bills. So it, it really, as time, and it's just like reporting, you know, 
early on, they say you got a, a two minute segment. You're like, oh wow, you get nervous, but then oh, it's yeah. like, then the it's more you take. do it, right. you want more. You want more mm-hmm. time. Yeah. yeah, I know that's that's definitely something. When I'm out live, you know, usually when you're out live in the morning, your segments like two and a half minutes. Mm-hmm. Um, but sometimes I'm like talking a little too much and I hear my producer like wrap it up Amanda wrap it up <laughs> wow. and you're like I got so much to say yeah, it happens. So, yeah. yeah. let me ask you this Amanda like the guys I like this conversation where it's headed um, we talk, we've talked about this where public speaking and stand up is very similar because there is no music I used to do music back in the day mm-hmm. and so it was cool because either way whether it was hot or there was not I still have the music to drain out the sound so mm-hmm. I'm going off of that but when you have no sound like absolutely <laughs> nothing you can hear everything so public speaking and comedy very similar to that. Yeah. But what I've noticed is a lot of news reporters are crazy fearful of public speaking. So when I talk to them, like, especially when I was like, hey, you should come on. They're like, I don't do that. And I'm really? like, but you're like talking to like all kinds of millions of people. They're like, yeah, dude, that freaks me out. They go, I'm just talking to like two guys behind the camera. And that's pretty much it. I remember wearing flip flops or whatever. Right. So yeah. with you, it was a different personality because I was like, I think she could do it. We're about to find out. I love out, public right? speaking. Yeah, That's it's that. literally why I majored in communications mm-hmm. in college. Like I said, when I was in high school, I didn't have great grades. I didn't know what exactly I wanted to do. And so I majored in communications for that exact reason. I was like, well, I like to talk. Like I'm really good <laughs> at public speaking. Might as well just do communications. Um, but yeah, I I am blessed that I'm not, you know, scared to speak publicly. I think it's just because I've always liked to talk since I was little. And I think a part of it is just, um, I used to be a dancer. I was a competitive dancer. And so I'm used to being in the spotlight. I'm used to having all eyes on me. I'm used to the constructive criticism. I'm used to just straight criticism. Um, So I think that honestly prepared me for uh, news, which is sort of like a performance, honestly. And so I think that's why I'm very comfortable in front of the camera and I enjoy talking. Oh, yeah. That's beautiful. No, it's the well-rounded mm-hmm. Amanda, you know, from little Amanda going yes. on, all those yeah. different experiences. You could see you could see it on TV for sure. Yes. Yeah. And another thing that we could see, I know it is May Mental Health Month, right? Yeah. And so one of the things that I really appreciated, obviously your energy, when I would watch you in the morning, I was like, who's this? <laughs> all right. Is she going to bring in that every single time? And then you brought it every single time. I'm like, I okay. try. <laughs> yeah, and you get kind of mixed. If you guys haven't watched it here in the Fresno area, Amanda looks so young. She gets mixed. I mix her up with some of the I high do. school students, which is a, a compliment. Right? There was one time some lady thought I was 15. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to take that as a compliment. Yeah, At first yeah. I was like, what the heck? I'm in my 30s. Yeah. But I was like, 15? okay that's, dope. that's cool yeah that's super cool <laughs> yeah because when we, were, we go speak at schools like i think i've joked with you i said why don't you just go to class yeah <laughs> just, yeah. just go in the hallway exactly. yeah how long before they catch you you know yes. just put a book back on and just kind of walk down you exactly. like walk around for a while before someone goes excuse it's me it's so true yeah i think one of my first stories when i was in fresno it had something to do with i think one of the schools uh was doing some effort with mental health mm-hmm. and i was trying to find where I was meeting the teacher and there is a staff member like, why are you out? Like, why aren't you in class? And I was like, oh, no, 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 I'm with ABC 30. I'm here for a story. I'm not a student. And she's like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. I was like, no, it's fine. I, I get it a lot. That's why sometimes I don't even like going to schools because they always get me confused. And I'm just like, oh gosh, I have to explain. I'm I'm not here for a project. I'm not trying to go to the bathroom. I'm just here for an interview. Where is your hall pass? Yeah, where is the hall pass? <laughs> when did you realize that you wanted to do the work like as far as mental health i mean i know you got a podcast we'll explore more about that but you're so open about that and that's one of the layers that i saw your energy your your what you see on tv when you meet you in person um team short or so me and you yes. right? team fun size all day fun size but when i saw that mental health and how open you are and transparent and vulnerable you are i was like those are the layers because everybody in Rice to it. We joke around like most of the time, but there's also another layer of Dre getting to know him, myself, Frankie, Sal. Um, when did you discover that you wanted to really pursue that kind of work for you to benefit you? I think it was honestly, I reached a very low point in my life. I think I, I started to realize I was noticing patterns in my life, certain patterns that would always bring certain type of people in my life, certain thoughts, patterns with thoughts that would keep me from 
reaching my goals or, or I just started noticing all these things and I started getting a little curious as to why that was. Why do I keep running into these same situations? And it was actually one of my good friends. He had started therapy and he was like, I think you should try out therapy. Like you should go talk to a therapist. And I was very, I mean, in Filipino culture, you don't talk about mm-hmm. mental health. You don't talk about therapy. And I was just like, I don't know. And I, I could hear, you know, my parents and my family be like, you don't want people to think you're crazy, you know, because that's what mm. they that's what people think sometimes is that therapy is for crazy people. Right. And so when my friend suggested that, I think I was already such at a low point. I was like, you know, what the heck, like what what will hurt? So I looked up a therapist, you know, went to my first therapy session and it just, I didn't have like a huge breakthrough, but I just felt a a release. Um, And then we started exploring more about my childhood and seeing how certain things in childhood, you know, how, kind of came into my adulthood and why I see these patterns coming up as an adult. And so that's when I wanted to start doing the work of like, okay, I can actually change this. You know, Um, I think I'm at that, one of my friends posted this on Instagram where she's like, I'm at that point in my life where I don't want to, you know, have people in my life that aren't uh, trying to grow and trying to improve themselves. Mm -hmm. And I always, and I used to be the one that would say this, this like, that's just how I am. That's just how I am. That's what it is. And for me, I'm like, no, that's such an excuse, you know, where you're choosing to stay that way. And and we're all on our different growth journeys, right? We're on a different healing journey. And there are people that are content with where they are. Um, for me, can't be me, can't relate. Like, I just want to grow. I want to improve. Um, and a part of that is kind of looking at your life and realizing you have to take accountability for things. I think what, and I, I, I'll share this because I'm sure a lot of people can relate. I would always be like, oh, I hate having a big heart. Like I, I give so much love. I care for people so much and I just end up getting hurt. People don't value me. Like they take advantage of me. And like, I would just place blame on everyone. Just like, oh, that person's a bad person because they treated me bad. But in reality, you know, I was the drama. Like I, I played a role in mm. many of the people that came in my life because Time after time, people would show me their true colors and I'd still allow them to stay in my life. Mm. Time and time, people would disappoint me and they wouldn't value me and I still would give them second chances. And so it wasn't that I was, I had this big heart, I had no boundaries. And so that Mm. was like one thing I had to learn in therapy was I had to have boundaries. Well, first of all, I didn't even know what boundaries were, which is why like I always let people that just didn't value me in my life. Um, So once I learned about boundaries, then it was about, okay, how do I implement them? How do I maintain them? And so then I got, I started seeing, oh, it is a good thing that I have a big heart, but I also have boundaries where I'm not going to allow people in my life if they don't deserve to be in my life, if they're not going to reciprocate that same energy. So that's like kind of doing the work. Why I wanted to start doing the work is because I wanted to finally take accountability for the role I play in a lot of the situations I found myself in or a lot of the thoughts that would come up. So that was kind of the start of doing the work. And I honestly credit therapy for that. I love it. I love it. You know what? Wow. We've got to give her some bars. Hey. Hey. No, I love it. The boundaries. I mean, you said it because we're open about that, like therapy and how it's benefited us personally. We even had um, our, our good friend therapist last year do the mental health uh, May uh, episode. But just those boundaries and really take taking self accountability, mm-hmm. I think it's has huge. been a game changer. Yeah. And a lot, and that, I feel like a lot of people don't do the work because the accountability scares them. Like to admit, like, Explore oh my gosh, yeah, I'm that. the drama. Oh my gosh, I play a role. Like that's so hard to do is to admit that you play a role and exactly. part of the things that happen in your life. And a lot of people don't want to do that. And so a lot that's why a lot of people are you know okay with. I'm okay with just where I am, you know, the whole, that's just how it is. That's just how I am. Um, But like I said, for me, can't be me. Can't be me. But they're okay where they are, but they want to rise. They do. They want to rise, but then you write this accountability is doing the work. Because then you always say, well, why did, how did they get that? Mm -hmm. You know, why are they doing that? It's like, well, they're doing probably some work, you know, to help them get there. Yeah. Mental health, mental health is so many layers Different layers. You know, we go straight to the crazy, but there's so many more pockets in there. Yes. There's always a why, you know? Yes. Um, That's what I learned with therapy is like, there's, there's so many layers, you know, what may seem like a simple answer is actually way deeper, Mm -hmm. you know, Um, and very at a subconscious level, I think. And that's the part of doing work is peeling back those layers and trying to figure out the root cause of things that happen. 
I love it. I love it. When did you start getting comfortable with that? Because you're going to get backlash from our parents, I think, culturally, too. That's something that they're not used to. That's not the norm. Was it a year or two? When did you kind of – and everybody's different. Everybody's journey is different. But when did you start feeling comfortable talking about that and yeah. kind of owning that? So I think – so I started therapy, I think, in 2020. Um, and then I really was just like, I really want to – dive deep into this inner work. And I actually, uh, signed up with a self-love coach Mm -hmm. and I went through a self-love program, a three month self-love program. And then I think I just started to feel liberated and empowered. And I think I was just like, this is such an amazing feeling to feel like this. And I want everyone to feel like this. And so that's when I started opening up about my mental health and, you know, the struggle, I mean, what it really came down to was just, I had no self-love for myself Um, and sharing that I was on this self-love and healing journey. And I shared that because I know so many people feel that way, you know? And I think when I was in high school, when I was struggling with mental health already, you know, and I didn't realize it until now that I'm an adult, I wish someone would have shared their story. And granted, we didn't have social media, you know, which is is such an easy way to share stories. But I wish I could have heard from someone so I could feel like, oh my gosh, I'm not alone. Like I'm not the only one having these thoughts or I'm not the only one feeling this way. This, oh, this is normal. And so that's when I became really comfortable in being vulnerable. I think a lot of people think vulnerability is a weakness and I a hundred percent believe vulnerability is such a sign of strength. Um, and I always like, I'll tell my friends, you know, if you can't cry in front of me, like we're not friends, you know, joking, but it's like, I want you to feel comfortable and be able to express yourself. I want to provide a safe space to people so they can be vulnerable. And I just, I have seen myself be vulnerable in different ways and sharing different stories with, you know, my chronic illness. You know, I did an episode on my ulcerative colitis. That's something I never wanted to talk about ever. Mm. Um, and then just to have people message me like, oh my gosh, like I have this too. I didn't think anyone else had it. And to know other reporters deal with it. I was like, oh my gosh, like twins. Um, and so like, it just, it really creates a community. And that's what's so important is community and connection. Um, And that's why I love being vulnerable because it makes people feel seen, heard and understood. And then you can unite and just, you know, talk about whatever struggles you're going through and then, and, and help get through them together. And so that's why I'm always like, I'm so willing to share my story anytime because I know someone out there, maybe not 50 or a hundred, but one person out there, I know will want to hear what I have to say and it will resonate with them. And then if I can help one person, I'm fine. Isn't that so cool that, you know, you've been encouraged and you, you've actually taken the reins. You're telling your story, even on this platform right here. Um, I I was encouraged too, because I had a friend who who wasn't my therapist, but he was a therapist. Mm -hmm. And when I told him, I say, man, I went to like six elementary schools. I went to five junior highs. I went to six high schools. So he said, wow, you know all that. Plus your mother, my mother was on drugs. And I, mm-hmm. I, I met, I saw my father for the first time at his funeral. You started mm-hmm. to tell these stories. He goes, man, you should, you should have been a basket case. You know, mm-hmm. I said, but there was an individual when I was young, he was a pastor in the church. He said, you're going to, you're going to touch people's lives. You're going to actually be impactful mm-hmm. in something. He goes, I, I don't know what that is, but I, I, you know, I just, I've, he sickled me out. So I leaned on that, you know, I didn't lean on all the other stuff to, you know, the not being stable and, you know, the drugs and the, the no father. I didn't lean on it. I just leaned on that. This one person told me when I was a young kid, like 11 years old, you're going to reach people on a, a big uh, level, you know, on a big platform. And that's kind of where I've led my life. So it's just, you got to find the positivity yeah. and lean on that, not the negative. Cause you're going to, everyone gets the negative exactly. that yes, comes at exactly. you in so many different ways. Either, either it's prevalent in your life or it's all around you. You know, where are you going to lean on? So I, I love the fact that you lean on the positive and you're just so outgoing and you can't let anybody take that from you. I know oh, certain no. times you felt like, man, they're trying to take away my joy. And, you know, it's like, man, that's like my one light that I can depend <laughs> on every day when I wake up. Here's Amanda. You know, we all depend on that. Like when you walk into the room, we know I, when when H said, well, Amanda's going to be I'm like, oh, cool. Yeah, she brings <laughs> exactly. like she brings a lot of energy. Sure, you you yeah. want to be around that as yeah. opposed to if someone's coming. Hey, guys. How's it going? You know, I may feel like that. And right. then you can't, right. you can't 
be around you because she's going to be like, hey, Dre. <laughs> yep. exactly. like, hey. Like, for sure. So, yeah, that's, that's so cool. Thank you. I think there's that switch, too, for both of you. It's a question. I'm going to start uh, with Dre then also Amanda. In comedy, I've heard, and Dre, obviously, you've been doing this OG in the game, killing it still, selling out, you know, clubs, arenas, wherever you go. Is there, like, a lot of pain in comedians? Because I've heard that, too, because you can make light of the situation. But there's also mm. a huge darkness. Like, And I've heard this for news reporters, too, the scheduling. Like, you're doing, like, a million different things. You have to do your own makeup. You got to get it from <laughs> point A to point B. Yeah. Starting with you, Dre, have you seen that, like, overwhelmingly in that industry? Even the time you, your events are usually nighttime, right? So yeah. everything's kind of out of order. But the order that seems organized is you going up and doing your thing. Talk about that a little bit. Have you noticed that in your career of like Well yeah, it's put it in perspective. You go and you get on stage adoring fans. They're cheering, they're laughing. Then afterwards they're coming up to you. They want to hug you. They want to take a picture. Then they like they tell you how great you are. They tell you a story about how they first saw you or they first heard about you, how they've been following you. Then they leave and you go back to your hotel room and you're all by yourself. Right. Mm. Yep. It's no one there. That's where comics, comedians, I can only speak of, that's when they get into the most trouble. Because how do I come, like, how do, I'm up here mm-hmm. and now I'm, how do, and that's when the drugs come into play. That's when um, all the vices, uh, what is, is it, you know, uh, women, is it, whatever your vice is, is going to, come out because now it's the pool so how do you you know get from there there that's why a lot of comics you know i just had a show with a comedian just came to town and he was like hey man I, let's hang out like i'm like bro i got a golf tournament in the morning yeah. i got like well, got family but like I, but i got i say you know i'm gonna take you to a spot because i know what that's like yeah. to be he was from dallas he came into town mm-hmm. shout out to jj and he was like he wasn't really really go to bed yet he'd never been to fresno so i took him to a nice spot and you know but it was cool he was there for like an hour, maybe an hour maybe mm-hmm. he was like bro i'm ready to go yeah. and i was like cool i am too yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nice. he just needed to get out for a little bit yeah. so it's just how you deal with that i know certain comedians uh dio hughley yeah. a friend of mine he has a, a companion dog he takes on the road oh, wow. Wow. wow so after he does his shows he goes back to he's got his big old husky it's huge yeah. like we were in the green room i was like who's giraffe <laughs> slash elephant is that <laughs> and then dio was like Boy, boy. And, and the dog came over and it's like that's his companion because for whatever reason you need to get through the night some of the greats they're able to go and channel all that and they write mm. they write they go and they, they they most create they say i'm most creative when i'm afterwards when i'm writing wow. so it's how do you feel that time mm-hmm. what helped me when i was on the road from going to the parties and hanging out and all the women i started playing golf you had to have an early tea time mm-hmm. so i was like i need to get some there sleep because yeah. i was so ready to go and play my best golf game i needed to so find what you need like to yeah. get through that dark period mm-hmm. and it is a two for i mean it you know you're going home. You're focusing on the next day. You could have been out doing some other things yeah, too, yeah. but you also enjoy the sport. I know hey, you don't be trying to play against Dre in the golf, man. His game's <laughs> serious. So, Frank, are you going to yeah. say something? I was going to say it's crazy to think, right, when you hear like of some of these greats who like take their lives and, yeah. they're, you know, these awesome comedians, super funny, like, and we think from the outside, mm-hmm. you're hilarious. You mm-hmm. make everybody laugh. Like, what could be so dark in your life? And I think I've said this before on the podcast, but somebody told me that a lot of these comedians – it's almost like the more stuff you know, um, the more depressed people might get. So, like, some of these greats, to be funny, you got to know about, like, local issues, like politics, laws, and stuff like mm-hmm. that, right? Yeah. So, the more crazy stuff that these people know, they're making light of it. But I feel like that kind of gets to them, too, right? Like, mm-hmm. just the more you know that sometimes it could be a bad thing. So, I feel that's why, like, a lot of comedians kind of, like, do that to the, uh, to themselves as well, you know? Yes. Yeah. What about news reporting right now, especially in 2024 moving forward, Amanda? Like, there's a lot of hats that you have to wear. Not like, I think I can do that. To have that title, you have to have that those things. So, oh, yeah. what are the layers behind that? I think being a news reporter, people think it's so glamorous. You know, they're like, "Oh my gosh, you're on TV every day. You probably get your makeup done, your hair. You probably have a lot of money." Like, all not true. Um, news, it's heavy. You know, there are the serious stories that you have to do, um, and then you know, in local news, whatever is happening locally in the community. And I'll say in the Central Valley, I mean, there's a lot of heavy stories. Um, I remember, like, I think. 
it was last November and it was every day I was coming into, there was a fatal crash. Um, and every day, like I would see Mm -hmm. the moment the family found out, you know, they came on scene and they found out and it's super heavy. Um, and then you also deal with the, just you as a person, we all go through tough days, right? Mm -hmm. You know, separate from work, you could be dealing with family things or, you know, maybe something with a significant other. And so you're struggling with that as well combined with what the news that you're giving. And so, and especially in news, I feel like, well, I know for me, I always felt because I had this very energetic, bubbly personality on social media, I had to be bubbly all the time when Mm. deep down I was like going through the worst time with my mental health, but I had to show up. I believed I had to show up on social media to be happy because I had to make sure everyone else was happy and spread my energy. Right. Um, but then it's, it's kind of like what Dre said, you have to find what works for you, different ways to cope and healthy ways to cope. And so for me, when I'm feeling, you know, a little low or if I'm having really bad anxiety, you know, journaling is huge for me. I love journaling. Another way is just going to dance. Um, I was a competitive dancer. Dancing always lights me up. It makes me feel really good inside. So it's finding those healthy ways to deal with the sadness. Because you can't, it's, it would be so dumb to say, oh, you're never, you're never going to deal with hard news stories and, and tragic news stories. Or you're never going to, you know, feel really low. Like that's just highs and lows. That's, that's life. And so it's about, okay, how do I approach when I do get to that low point, like what tools do I have in my toolkit that I can bring out and then be able to cope with that. And so for me, it's, it's the journaling, it's going to dance classes. Sometimes it's just going out on my balcony with my dog and just like sitting there and just breathing in fresh air and just Mm. being outside, just what, what works for you. I think one, when I was in my self-love program, one thing that my coach had me do is she would have me schedule out things in my calendar of things that bring me joy. So it sounds funny, but I love dumplings and I love gyoza. Mm-hmm. Every two weeks, I would make it because that's what brought me joy. Yeah. And so it always like I'd see on my calendar, oh, I get to do this. It was something to look forward to. And so that's something that I've added to my toolkit is like schedule out things in your calendar that bring you joy. Um, so you have something to look forward to. Mm-hmm. And so you're not waiting until once you're at that low, low, low and you're like, oh, my gosh, what do I do? How do I get out of this? Um, you're just constantly filling yourself with joy when you schedule it out. Uh, beautiful, beautiful. I'm going to give you another one. Right there. There I'm getting all of these there bells. I love it. The double A. So I got to ask you because a lot of people, um, you know, you mentioned some names, you know, of comedians that they have a darker side to them, you know, and I think everybody does in my, my firm opinion. Everybody goes through different things, but they don't know how to explore different options of what mm. works for them. I mean, Robin Williams to rest in peace, Chester Bennington from Lincoln Park too. That was one of my favorites. Like when he passed. I literally, it was hard for me to teach that day. Like, I was just like, dang, because he's always talked about that darkness through his songs. I did not get to meet him, but all my buddies, like in the rock scene, they all met him and they all said the same thing. They're like, that dude was such a light and so generous and so Mm -hmm. just overwhelmingly positive when he's out with people. But like Dre was saying, once you're off the stage, you're by yourself. And a lot of people don't know how to manage that. And ultimately, it's exhausting, right? So for you to even incorporate and really be self-aware enough to understand the layers that you're contributing to your work and and to our community, you know, I think that's really beautiful for sure. Thank you. Yeah, it was, I think it's important for everyone to find those healthy coping skills because like I said, life is always going to give you highs and lows and and you have to have a healthy way to deal with those lows because you don't want to get to that, that point, you know, where you're taking your own life. Right. So it's so important to find healthy coping skills. Absolutely. I mean, research, according to research study by the Myers-Briggs Company on Self-Awareness, communication tools such as therapy often lead to an improved quality of life, but also financial gain. Cha-ching, right? So when <laughs> our professors were talking about that, I was like, might want to sign up for that, right? Make a couple more bucks. So there's a correlation that intersects, right? Why do you think that is? And I think you've unpacked that a little bit more, but what has worked for you going to therapy and you're like, I feel better. I feel better with people. I have those boundaries. Maybe talk about that a little bit. I feel like doing the inner work with therapy, I think I share this because a lot of people were very surprised to hear when I started sharing my journey was I lacked so much self-confidence and which is crazy because they're like, 
but you're on TV every day. You have hundreds of thousands of people watching you. How do you have low self-confidence? So I had low self-confidence. I didn't love myself. I didn't know my worth. And going to therapy, doing the inner work, that's my biggest gain is that I am obsessed with myself. I have so much more confidence. And I feel like when you step into confidence, when you step into your power, you do attract that abundance. And it could be abundance of money. Yeah. It could be abundance of opportunities. You know, for example, when I started being vulnerable and sharing my story and being real, I started attracting more opportunities to share my story and to be on podcasts to make a bigger impact. Yeah. And so that's why I think it's so important that you do the inner work to get closer to your most authentic self. Because when you are your most authentic self, when you step into your power, that's when the abundance comes, whether that be money, opportunities, good people in your life, just whatever it may be, more energy, abundance of energy. Um, and so that was my biggest gain going into therapy and doing the inner work is the freaking confidence and, and just knowing that I am worthy and that, you know, I love myself so much. I'm so obsessed with myself and not in like a conceited way, but it's, I'm so in love with the relationship I have with myself that when it comes to, you know, maybe a relationship with others and especially like talking romantic relationships, when I love myself so much, um, you know, whoever, if I start, when I start dating again, you know, they're not competing against another person. They're competing with me. You know, mm -hmm. are you going to bring peace to my life? Cause I already can give all my, myself, all this stuff. So what can you add to it? And so that's why I always tell people like, you have to work on your self-love. Self-love is key to everything um, because that's what's going to open the doors, really. I love it. I love it, girl. I love it. <laughs> so when you're talking about these different issues that you've really, and again, it's a, it's a race. Like Nipsey Hussle used to say, mm. marathon continues. Yes. Shout out to the hey. conference we did in Bakersfield. It's yes. called the Marathon Continues. Dre, you killed it, man. That was, that was on another level. But Thank we you. did talk about mental health, you know, and it was yeah. uh, for that specific conference, it was men of color that were in mm. the room. And it was refreshing to just see everybody kind of nodding their head like, yep, like mm. we need to start breaking those stigmas. Yes. Yeah. Oh my gosh. It's so important. And that's, and you you know, what's interesting and what kind of frustrates me sometimes is when we see celebrity deaths, you know, yeah. suicides, you hear like, oh my God, you always hear check in on your friends, yeah. like make sure you check in on people that are, you know, really happy and smiling. But then when people share their struggles, then there's sometimes the people that are like, they just want attention or like, oh, they're so dramatic or, oh my gosh, people are so sensitive these days when people are literally trying to share their story and, you know, maybe reach out for help. And so I think that's what frustrates me still. Still, is like, I'm glad that mental health is starting to get talked about because it is long overdue, mm -hmm. but it's also, we need to still work on our empathy. I feel like when people are reaching out for help and sharing and being vulnerable, instead of looking at them, like you just want attention or, oh my gosh, you're so dramatic. You're so sensitive. Um, why can't we just be empathetic and like be there and support? Because then we're going to keep constantly going to that cycle of like, oh my gosh, I didn't even know, like, we need to start doing this more. It's, we, we really do need to break that stigma. And I think, and that's huge, I think in, um, you know, with men, men's mental health is a huge thing. And I, I obviously not a guy, but I know just talking to a lot of my guy friends, you know, if you talk about your mental health, that's a, a sign of weakness. Um, but I think it's so important that men and everyone understands like, it's okay not to be okay. I know it sounds so cliche, but it is okay not to be okay. Um, and it's, it's more of how do you handle that? How do you move forward from that? And so I'm, I'm glad that mental health is being talked about more. It's, it's something that I wish was talked about when I was younger. Um, but I'm glad, and I'm glad also to see that the younger generation mm -hmm. is really talking about it more. And I love, I I've done so many stories with high schools that have their own NAMI groups, um, which, you know, is the national Alliance of mental mm -hmm. illness. They're run by students, you know, they, they put on these, events to raise awareness. And I love the fact that that generation is taking their mental health seriously and, and trying to find ways to help their, their peers and give them resources. Um, because I think, I mean, I don't know for you guys, if you guys had that when you were in high school, like I didn't have that in high no. school at all. So to see this generation really taking it seriously and continuing the conversation, I love it. And that's, I think we all have to play a part in what, I mean, this is great having this conversation. 
you know, I I dug down a couple of months ago, even further than that, was thinking about it. You know, you pray about it. You know, how can I be more imp- impactful? Because I've seen how it has affected people. I've seen how it has affected me. And people tell me all the time, Dre, you, you seem very strong mentally. I'm like, yeah, but there's times mm-hmm. when I, I feel the pressure. And I do. And I say, man, if I, someone who considers himself mentally strong, mm-hmm. sometimes get down and, and depressed about some things, then I know this is a prevalent mm-hmm. problem that we need addressing. Yeah. Therefore... I'm having my golf tournament, which is That's about right. for mental Perfect health, yeah. oh, uh, May I 17th. That. And, um, you know, we are uh, just really having a great time uh, putting it together and working with different organizations uh, to make it happen. So it is really, truly a blessing awesome. because I'm taking two passions, you know, golf yeah. and, and the mental health and, and getting awareness out. And we'll be at Eagle Springs Golf Course, May 17th. If you need more information, uh, please go to FresnoTeeOff.org and you can sign up and get right in on there. And make things happen. So, uh, yeah, just trying to be that's a part awesome. of it, man. And and, that's, and raising money to go help fight the situation. Because it is out there, man. It's mm-hmm. everywhere. It's not just a dude walking down the street talking to himself. It's that guy sitting in that cubicle next to you mm-hmm. who's got his head yes. down. He's dealing with it as well. Yeah. Yeah, that- no, you guys are right. Like, when we grew up, like, nobody talked about it. And even, like, in the Latino culture, and I know the Filipino culture, is, yeah. Yeah, we're very, very, very much alike. And we, you know... We, we never discussed it. My dad never discussed it with me. And, and I, I know, like, we all go through it, right? And and now I do love the fact that it's it's normalized, right? Like, in the campuses and stuff like that. And, like, you know, like you're saying, now there's, like, clubs and schools. And this is good. Like, for, for me, having four kids at home, I love the fact that they have those resources. And we had the president for uh, Fresno City on. And he mm-hmm. had a lot that's of services right. for mental health, which yeah. is amazing awesome. to know, man. So, yeah, that's good. I think what the uh, conversation right now where it's leading to is something that triggered when you guys were, especially Frankie right now with uh, Dr. Pimentel. Mm -hmm. I always felt, Amanda, maybe you could echo this. I always felt that I was different with different people. (laughs) And so some people would be like, oh, your energy was really hot over here, but you're kind of like this way. And so doing the work, I realized, well, that's me every single time. That's my authentic self at every single scenario. And sometimes you feel guilty. Like, am I kind of being fake? Or is it just I'm not feeling it today, right? So Mm -hmm. did you ever feel that guilt, you know, where you just like, I'm not on my A game? Because you bring a lot of energy. And when people don't see it, because you can't be on 120% of the time. Oh, no, definitely not. Do you feel guilty? And then with the work, I think that helps, correct? I think part of it is knowing that you're not going to give 100% every day, Mm. um, whether that be to work, whether that be showing up in friendships, showing up in relationships. Like, it's just not possible to be a hundred percent every day, but if you're able to be 70%, that's still your best. Um, and I think that was a part of doing the work is not feeling guilty for that of, you know, how much effort I can give and how much energy I could bring to a certain situation. Like you said, it's just, there are days where I'm off. And if I can't be a hundred percent, that's okay. You know, if I can be 70%, that's still a hundred percent on that day. Cause if that's the only only I can give 70% still a hundred percent on that day. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I've definitely related to that before where I'm just like, like the whole, am I fake? Am I being fake here? Um, but it's just like, no, I just, I don't have the capacity. Um, cause I have, my social battery can get drained very fast. Um, so going to different situations, you know, where my social battery is not all there, I am going to show up a little different. Um, but that's okay. And I'm, I'm glad that I have a good support system that understands that. And that is like, okay, Amanda's just, you know, she's off her A game, but it's, it's not a big deal. Um, so it, it helps having a good support system that kind of understand that as well. That's really good. I think that's a really important for our viewers to understand too, because you feel guilty a lot of the time of like, man, I should have brought it like this way. People even told me, you know, you're a little bit different, but it's also the context of everything. Well, the energy was different. <laughs> I was having yeah. a good time over here. This is more chill. And I think yeah. Dre's really taught me that, you know, we could watch a Raider game and we could be, you know, yelling at the TV and just kind of chilling out, or we yeah. could be in New Orleans dancing together at a jazz <laughs> club, right? And we did. So I might do got some moves too. You got some moves. So we went right right next to each other when we were dancing. We were spread out. <laughs> oh, yeah, really? yeah, yeah, yeah. He was right. over there. I was over there. Just, he might have flipped me over a couple yeah, times. A couple <laughs> times. <laughs> No, I think that's really important because, again, it's um, something that's part of the learning process of, like, I'm not going to be myself every single day or what I envision myself to be. Mm -hmm. We know when we're in that pocket of, like, I feel really good around these people. This is this kind of environment, but also I could tone it down. I think it's about having balance, too. Oh, yeah. And it's getting out of that people-pleasing mindset, you you know? Oh, my gosh. Talk about that. Talk about that. Recovering people-pleaser right here, always (laughs) wanting to make everyone happy, you know, wanted to just, I didn't want anyone to be mad at me. So I would 
I wouldn't have boundaries, right? And I would just, I would say yes to things. I would show up to, in ways that people, you know, wanted me because I knew they wanted me to show up that way. Um, And then you just realize I got to a point where I was like, I'm not going to be for everyone. And I I shouldn't want to be for everyone because then I'm not going to be authentically me if I'm going to try to show up trying to please everyone. And so I got to that point where I was like, people are going to take me as I am. They're going to, this is me. And if they don't like me, that's fine. You know, there are people that I'm like, you know, you're not for me and that's okay. That doesn't make me a bad person. That doesn't make them a bad person. It's just not aligned. Right. And so I think getting out of the people pleasing habit of trying to make everyone happy, um, has also, I feel like helped me become a happier person because I'm not dimming myself for anyone. I always, um, would hear sometimes, oh, you're too much. Like you're just too much. And, and I, I've heard that in news, you know, I, I remember when I was in Kansas, there was a viewer that wrote, you know, Amanda's just too much energy. She's just over the top. And I was just like, oh my gosh. And so I, I took that really serious and I started to just dim my light and not come, um, you know, on air as energetic. And then I, but I felt so miserable because I was like, this is not me. And then I remember someone at my work was like, if I, he was leaving the station, he was going into something else. And he said, if I can leave you one advice is your personality off air should always be the personality you have on air and forget what other people think. And I was like, you know what? You're right. And so I started showing up on air as Amanda. And yeah, I would get some people that'd be like, oh, you're too much. But then I would get way more people like, oh my gosh, I can, she seems so fun. Like I want to be her best friend. Like I was able to build that connection. And that's huge in news. You have to build a connection with people. You want people to trust you. Um, And that's part of it is being your real authentic self. And, you know, sometimes even on social media, there are times I'm like, should I post that? Like, are people going to, you know, like me? Are they going to unfollow me? And that, and then I get to a point, I'm like, I don't care, you know, when, and it's so funny when I do see my follower count go down, I'm like, yes, these are all the people that are not aligned with me. So I'm getting rid of the people that are not aligned with me. And then, you know, my follower count will go up and then I'll be like, you know, these are people that actually want to follow me because they enjoy what I post. They enjoy what I share. They, you know, admire my vulnerability. Anytime my follower accounts goes down, I honestly think of it as a win because I'm like, Mm -hmm. those are people that that are not aligned with me and that's okay. That doesn't make them bad. You know, that doesn't say anything about me. It's just, we're not aligned and that's fine. Bar is another one. There we go. There we go. Yeah, I think for the uh, younger generation too, because social media, oh. you know, for their platform, whatever it is, and they obviously don't have the platform like at this table because everybody's using in their in their industry. But you guys, especially both of you guys, you guys are out there in the masses where dealing with so many people, and you're already expecting that. And I think normalizing, like, okay, I'm not going to be for everyone. That you phrase, don't want to be yeah, for everyone exactly. because if you right. want, yeah, you can't be. Yeah, you exactly. can't be. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And if you are, if you have that mindset of like, I want to make everyone happy, there's something in you that you're going to dim down mm. or, you know, try not to do to make other people happy. That's and right. like, you need to make yourself happy. And the only way you make yourself happy is by being your most authentic self. Yeah. So. My best me is going to bring in the most people mm-hmm. in my air, in my zone. That's mm-hmm. like the yes. most people are going to attract as I, if I'm right. being myself, my best me. And that's how you got to look at it. You know, yeah. people are going to label you. They're going to say whatever. Mm-hmm. Someone Regardless. called me on the radio. This guy on there trying to be Eddie Murphy on the radio. I was like, well, who don't want to be Eddie Murphy? Right. Yet? I mean, it's right. like a success. Mm-hmm. Like if you just said somebody who wasn't successful, maybe that would irritate me. But like, wow, yo, so you won't think I'm trying to be someone successful? Thank you. Thank you. That's a <laughs> huge compliment. I'm gonna be me, but if I, you know, if I get into that lane of success, then I'm that's a win-win mm-hmm. for me and my family. Yeah. And it's important to realize too that the way people see you says nothing about you. It's it's honestly like a mirror. That's what I realized when, and I say this because I used to be this person. Whenever I would see a confident woman, I'd just be like, oh my gosh. Like I would get so annoyed. And it's because <laughs> I realized like I wasn't confident. Like mm. her confidence is something mm. that I lacked. Yeah. And that's why I always think when someone is hating on you, it's just a mirror to them of what they're lacking. And so I never take it personally. I take it as like a compliment of like, okay, you know, you're obviously yeah. hating because you don't have this, <laughs> but oh, you know, you that's on you but yeah you can't take it personally however people treat you however they feel about you it's it's never about you it's always about them 
it. Deion Sanders is one of my favorites, man. I love prime time. Like, prime time. You know, people think he's cocky, and for me, I just he's very confident in his own skin. One of the favorite quotes I have by him is similar to yours, Amanda. It says, "Don't let your insecurities bleed on my confidence." Mm. And I'm like, man, that's so true because so true. a lot of people, you know, oh, I'm using this as an example. Frankie, John, uh, Dre, Amanda, they think they're all that. And I'm like, man, if you're a mind reader, you'd be on tour. Let's go take this on a show. Yeah. You know, it's like, <laughs> yeah. but we all they also don't know. When the, the limelight's off, a lot of the times we're just by ourselves. We're just like, every, you know, chilling everybody else. So I think that's really important. Um, for therapy, again, what would you recommend to those viewers that are just considering it? You know, they're hearing us talk. They're hearing us normalize the conversation. They're hearing about the many benefits. What's going to maybe motivate them to do this, in your opinion? Um, one thing I do want to share about therapy is that you're – you're not, I think a lot of people go in sometimes and they think they're going to have this like aha moment, this like breakthrough during the first session. Um, that's not it. It's, it's little like reprogramming of your mind, your thoughts. Um, it's not going to be this whole like aha, like lights coming out of your head kind of moment. Um, it's, it's going to take a little work and it's like, gradual, like 1% every day. Um, but I, I always tell people therapy is not for, you know, the crazy. I honestly recommend if you are in a good point in your life, go to therapy now. Mm -hmm. Because like I said, the highs and lows, they're going to come and those extreme lows are always going to come. And that's where therapy plays a role is because when you do get to that low, you already are in therapy. You already have those skills mm -hmm. to like be in this low and be like, okay, I need to take these toolkit, this out of that's my right. toolkit. Um, so, I mean, I would say to people go now, you know, if you are, if you are in a high, if you are doing good, if you are content, go now because you are, you are going to get to a low. I hate to say it, but we mm -hmm. all do. Like one thing life is going to do is going life, you know? And right. so it's good to already be prepared, um, to figure out how to get out of that low. And so I, I honestly think everyone benefits from therapy. I think that, and I, I do think that the self, um, self-help books, you know, are also great podcasts are also great, but I do, I like the therapist, me personally, because it's a professional, obviously that can shine lights on like my blind spots. I have a lot of blind spots. Everyone has a light, a lot of blind spots. There are things I went into therapy. I didn't even realize I needed to work on until mm -hmm. she was like, Oh, wow. here. And wow. I was like, Oh dang, I didn't even realize that. <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a good professional. You can yeah. listen to self-help books and podcasts all you want, but sometimes you need that outside person to shine a light on mm. the blind spot. There you go. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. And before we get to the next question, I will add on a lot of people that go once and then they quit and they're like, yeah, it wasn't for me. And I'm like, bro, like, do you go to one restaurant and that's it? Like, or do you will drive one car and you're like, I'm going to take it. Right. Yeah. So, or date, I'm not even getting to that one. Right. <laughs> Cause we do know some people that date one person. They just and they're just done, yeah. Right. But, um, I think you want to find the right fit for you. You do. And, and, and that's why I say just, if you don't, if the first therapist you have doesn't work out, go to another one, mm -hmm. find someone else. Um, I remember my friend reaching out to me and she started therapy and she was like, how do I know if I have a good therapist? Like, what is it? What does that look like? And I'm like, well, you know, someone that you feel comfortable with, obviously, you know, you want someone that listens to you. Um, and that isn't like, you need to do this kind of thing. Like they're very empathetic and understanding and you, it's like a car, right? You test drive it and right. you figure it out. Um, but I think it's also important again to remember is you're not going to get this huge breakthrough right away. And just because you don't get a huge breakthrough doesn't mean it's not working. Okay. No, yeah, it's like, Baby steps, right? Like I, yes. I see the brain like a muscle, right? So it's like we go to the gym to get fit. You're mm -hmm. not going to get fit right, and right day, away. You know, yeah. It's a, it's, it should be like a lifestyle, right? So I see going to therapy, then going to the gym. You know, yes. One percent. Like you said, every day you're going to get those gains. One percent. I love 1%. it. That's a good example. Mm -hmm. Great example. Amanda, before we get into the lightning round, um, as a news reporter, there's a lot of darkness. There's a lot of darkness in our days, but... There's a lot of positive. There's a lot of light. Yeah. What's one thing, especially in Fresno? I know you've been around it's a different ra or not radio station, but news stations, but specifically Central California, ABC 30, working here in SenCal. What's one like real positive story that you'll always remember? Um, Positive story. So I'm on the health beat, so I do a lot of health-related stories. Um, I think one that I remember is there is a little girl, Zoe. Uh, she's two now, and she has spinal muscular atrophy. 
and her mom, single mom, and she was just like really struggling with, I mean, she basically, her house turned into a hospital room. Like she had all the different equipment, the breathing tube, right? And this was like two-year-old, you know, and she was connected to, you know, her G-tube and, and the oxygen. And I remember she reached out and she was just like, I don't have enough money to like, she has to get all this medicine and these equipment, it's expensive. And she's like, I just don't know what to do. I'm a single mom. Like, I just, I need the help. And, you know, I don't want to ask, you know, to, a lot of people don't like asking for help, you know? And so it was a, a, a story that I shared and she got so much money to just keep providing that equipment and care that her daughter needs. And I, I honestly, I've on it. There's so many stories that are the same because the central Valley is so generous. Um, and when they hear about someone in their community in need, they don't even think twice. They don't even think twice. And there are so many stories, not that even I've done, but other reporters at ABC 30, where someone in our community needs help and the Central Valley would pull through. And those are my favorite stories to do. Because yeah, we do have a lot of, and it's, and it's always the stories that are really hard to hear, but then they turn out so beautiful because the community comes out to help. And I love that. That's beautiful. Wow. Family, let's give it up for Amanda Aguilar. Amanda, Amanda Aguilar. Now, Amanda, before you get on out of here, Dre, we got something to explain. We got some questions. Ooh. Let's go ahead and talk about that. Oh, it's the lightning round. Yeah. <laughs> what we'll do is we'll ask you a question. Really okay. quick questions and then need a really quick answer. So Ooh, this is nerve-wracking. Like, hit them hit quick. Yeah. Get it in and let's make it happen. Your size is very evident. <laughs> you know? You're a petite woman. Fun if, size. If you could be the perfect height, what would it be for you? I, I would just be my size. 4'11". 4'11". 4'11". You know why? Because my feet are small and I wear children's shoes. And Huge so discount. That's, yes, it's very inexpensive. Okay. I will say that. I'm a two and a half in kids, so. Wow. Okay, all right. So I hit her again? We'll be hit again? Yeah, hit her again, yeah. Okay, all right. Now that you want, your, your perfect height is the height you are now. <laughs> uh, dream job. Would you want to be on an <sighs> Oprah Winfrey level or a Gail King level? Mm. I honestly, I don't even think I would be in broadcast news. I think my dream job, and this is, sounds probably so funny, but I would want to be a day camp leader if it paid really well. <laughs> hey, so I my first that. job in college was a day camp leader. And I, on the summer and winter breaks, I would be a day camp leader for kids like three to five. And then I also had a six to 12 year old group. And all we did every day was play games, did like science projects, would go to field trips, go swimming every Friday. It was so <laughs> cool. fun. And I was like, if I could have any dream job and it paid really well, if day camping <laughs> paid really well, I would want to do that. Because okay. I love kids. Well, you guys know that. You okay. know, I have a soft spot for kids. So We're going to shorten your answers a little bit. <laughs> I got one more for okay. you. Yeah, one more on. in your lightning round. Okay, we know you like the dumplings. Okay. Okay, what would be the perfect dish in front of you right now if it was just ready to go and they put it in front of you? Gyoza dumplings. That would be it. That would be right it. Right there in front of you. Okay. Yes. Yeah. I, I've told, if I know you're going to shorten this answer, but my dream proposal, I want the ring in a plate of dumplings. Wow. wow. Nice. Got some standards right there. Mm -hmm. All right. I like that. All right. All, right. <laughs> All right, Amanda, you ready to go? I'm going to yes. ask five questions. Okay. Ready? Okay. So you've traveled all over the United States, right? Working. What's your dream city? That I've already been to? No. Like, okay. where do you want to, like your final resting? Bay Area. So, Bay Area. Hello. Okay. Home. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Love it. We live in the Central Valley, right? There's a lot of taco trucks out here. <laughs> You're going to get a, or, are you going to order a burrito or a taco? Taco. Hey, quick. Okay. Al Pastor. Yeah. <laughs> nice. <laughs> okay. Um, you're giving me uh, some comics vibes, so I'll tell you who it is right now. Besides Dre, who's your favorite comedian? Mm. Joe Coy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Joe Coy. Yeah, yeah, for sure. You give me Angela Johnson vibes. Real. That's so crazy. I've heard that before. And she's from the Bay Area. Yeah. So like, oh, my gosh. The, the that's so funny. Team. Joe Coy got the Filipino flavor. That yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's too funny. Yeah, Joe Coy. That's funny. Okay. And you're going on a trip. You're going to go to the mountains or the beach? Beach. I'm a relaxing girl. I don't want to be walking. Well, I'm going to give you one more. <laughs> okay. I'm give you one more. So um, on the weekend, are you going to wake up early? You don't got work. You can wake up late. Unfortunately, I wake up early. <laughs> It Every just day. happens. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you so much. <laughs> excellent, excellent, excellent. All right, Amanda, these going to go fast, double A. These going to go fast. All right, favorite non-alcoholic drink? <gasps> Kin. 
What's in your current playlist? Sexy red. Okay. <laughs> hey, I didn't see that one coming. Fill in the blank. Mental health is important. All right. Green flag. Turn on that is not physical. Self development. Yeah, I love that. Growth. Mm-hmm. Celebrity crush. <gasps> Michael B. Jordan. Man, no! Brady Jacobs said this is the other way. You guys are going to fight. I know you guys are cool. We're all cool. So, yeah, you're going to have to fight for Michael B. Jordan. <laughs> Celebrity crush, but female edition. <gasps> oh. Oh, my gosh. Female. Reese Witherspoon. Okay. Ooh, okay. okay. I love Reese. Okay. Yeah. Right. Go to a restaurant in Fresno. Heirloom. Oh, that's one of my favorite. I love it. Me and Monty love going there all the time. I'm a little too obsessed with it. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Anyone over here in Visalia. When your time comes to a close at ABC 30 Fresno, what do you hope to leave behind? I just hope to leave behind that being authentic. I want people to realize it's okay to be you and be authentic. You might be too much, you know, for some people, but they're just people. And so I, that's what I hope is that people see me on ABC 30 and they're like, you know what? If she can be authentic, I'm going to be authentic too. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Family, give it up for Mandy Aguilar one time. I want to thank you so much for joining us in May, Mental Health Month. No better person than you to come thank on the show you. and I give us your insight. That. We appreciate you so much. We definitely. love you, man. Like you're I love you guys. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, love I you always sure. enjoy coming on here and just being in your presence, your energy. Thank you Honorary, so much. Uh, honorary team members. Yeah, 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 for sure. <laughs> honorary. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. We'll have to get her some little shoes, right? Some shoes yeah. or something yeah. like that. Two and, <laughs> two and a half, right? <laughs> Family, thank you so much for joining us on another episode of the Rise to It podcast. Two fingers spread try your best to stay positive and as always if you can rise to it you can Can rise rise through through it. it we'll catch you later